welcome uh, Scott Corwin. Uh, Scott serves as Deloitte's U.S. leader for sustainability and climate change, really with a responsibility uh, around accounting, assurance, advisory, consulting, and tax to assist clients uh, in a transition to low carbon future. So Scott, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of this event. Um, let's start with, you know, you, you published recently a paper, Leading in a Low Carbon Future, a System of Systems Approach to Addressing Climate Change. Um, for those not familiar with system thinking or a systems approach, what, what, you know, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, Josh, first off, thank you for inviting us to join you today and to, to have this conversation. I'm really delighted and delighted to be back in Silicon Valley. So last May, my co-author, Derek Pankritz, who's I can't see because of the lights, he and I wrote a piece, but it was really built. Uh, we wrote the article, was published. And essentially, the, the backdrop story to this was that we, um, in really focusing on the work we're doing with clients, wanted to create what is a North Star. And for us, um, we have a credo, just like Microsoft has a credo. Ours is impact that matters. And if you're going to be in sustainability and climate change, our view is that the impact that matters is how are we going to try to actually achieve the Paris targets? How do we make that a reality? It isn't about the dollars we generate. You know, if we do good work, that'll come. So we stepped back and we basically said, look, all of the individual commitments that Professor, uh, I'm going to mispronounce her name. Uh, oh, hey-ho. Hey-ho yeah. um, talked about don't add up to you know, 20%. You look at all the corporate um, commitments and even national commitments are made, but in fact, they don't really have a lot of detailed substance and action plans behind them. And the net of it is, is that here we are in 2022. We have got to cut emissions by 50% by 2030. And according to the UN, we've cut barely a percent. So there's, there's a disconnect here of cosmic proportions. And the way that we thought about it is we actually need to take complex interconnected systems and we have to make progress in parallel, not in a serial way. So what does that mean? It means decarbonizing the energy system. And you know we know what needs to be done. We have got to move off of fossil fuels. We have to move to renewable energy. We have to build a smart grid. We, we know the order of magnitude of what we have to do. In parallel, we have got to decarbonize the mobility and transportation system. We have pieces today that we can do to do that in terms of electrification, eventually hydrogen. We have the ability to build seamless integrated mobility the way that you know, they're trying to do in San Francisco and every other city. Similarly, in industrials and manufacturing and chemicals, there's a lot of work to take out the energy intensity of what's needed. We need to move forward on those. Your um, food, which has come up, and yes, maybe it's not the biggest emitter, but it's a really important one because of methane. We actually now have solutions to be able to decarbonize. So it's a question of how do you decarbonize all these major systems in parallel? And all of the fantastic work. I love Speed and Scale. I thought it was a great book. I really admire the research that they did. But what it does is it basically says, here's where we're at. Here's where we need to get to. These are the kinds of things we need to do. And what systems thinking does, and it came you know, from our common alma mater when I was there, um, you know, there was a report that came out in the early 70s on the Club of Rome. We weren't there at the same time. but No, we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I was there a little earlier than you. Uh, um, you know, there was the Club of Rome report that came out and basically said it's the limits to growth. And it, was, it, it hit with a thud because no one wanted to talk about economic growth and the implications of pulling back. Well, that, that conversation is now with us 50 years later and the reality of that. So this idea of systems thinking is a way that we have a chance of really looking at um, what are the leverage points inside these systems, the interconnections between energy and mobility, energy and food. And that's the work we need to do now. We need to really lay out the roadmaps, the synchronized roadmaps, how investment capital gets there, the role that government's going to play to facilitate it. My goodness, the really important role that tech's going to play. These are force multipliers in making this a reality. 
And but we've heard, you know, the word collaboration, coordination, right? What you propose is people in this room that represent different industries, different sectors, public sector, private sector, need to come together towards this common goal. You know, how do you get people who are potentially competitors or ecosystem players, we've heard ecosystem a lot, to work together and align, um, you know, towards these goals? Whose job is it to coordinate and orchestrate all this? Well, sadly, it's not clear that there is a single player who could be the orchestrator. Government clearly has a role, right? It's, you know, government is a regulator. It's a policy maker. It is um, the single biggest purchaser of goods and services. So th th what it decides, it is a- and You gave an ex interesting an example about the, 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 the postal you know, carriers are making a choice on new, do we go EV? Right, and Louis DeJoy obviously having to make a choice of what is the vehicle, because we're gonna have these vehicles for 10 years. We're gonna have them for a lot longer. <laughs> so the traditional postal vehicle, Josh and I talked about this on a call, it's just sort of one little example, is up for renewal. Those vehicles have been around for decades. And basically what they're doing is they're going to market to actually just replace them, which is like madness. Like why aren't these going to be electric vehicles? In fact, we have post office on every main street in America. Why aren't there chargers at those post office? So at night they could be used for these carriers, but that during the day they could bring high speed charging directly into communities. And that's an idea of a systems thinking about how do you connect the pieces? So while we're on this EV example, if we don't use renewable energy into the recharging system, or the utilities today don't, in a lot of places, have enough capacity to deliver the electricity we need if we actually have the penetration we're talking about. So you now need to get the auto manufacturers, you've got to get the, all of the key energy players, you've got to get the investors, right? We've got to figure out how we're going to tip these markets. Another piece of that is like ride hailing. We've been engaged in an effort to look at how do you electrify ride hailing. And it's a really simple challenge. It's not a technological challenge. It's about tipping economic markets. And the problem with it is that today, the individual drivers are basically making the choice of the vehicles that they're going to use. They see a price premium of about $3,500 up front. A lot of them live in apartments that don't have chargers. The length of time to go find a charger takes away from their income. So you've got behavioral impediments that are market-based that we need to figure it out. And so one of the things we did at Deloitte is we tried to catalyze a movement with some of our competitors and others to say, we'll pay a price premium. We'll pay the green premium because we're a big user of that in certain cities. So, you know, when you talk about the financial impact, right? So, you know, when you outline in the paper and as you mentioned, finance and investment is one of the key drivers here. Um, obviously there was, a, I think, uh, Lucas and David talked about um, the SEC and the, setting now two sets of books, but you're a big accounting firm. So talk a little about the investment and how the CFO now within companies and with the SEC ruling, how that all sort of connects together. So, so there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, uh, what's really interesting is that literally every organization of any consequence is now wrestling with this topic. They are feeling the pressures of how Wall Street is going to value them if they're a public company, which is very real. It affects their cost of capital. It affects the investment choices they make. Um, they care very much about their employees and what it means to talent attraction. And um, they care very much about the SEC ruling. And the, the thing that had been really frustrating for a lot of corporations is that there were different um, uh, protocols globally, and what they would really like is a common global standard, because in every country you do business in, you've got to report according to those standards. And at least where we're headed in the US in the current moment is there's a lot of alignment with the European standards. So we'll make it easier in terms of compliance. Right. And you know, so the three areas, right, you talk about finance and investment, obviously we're at techonomy, so the tech component, you, you have uh, a long history of being focused on mobility before taking on this, this, the climate and sustainability role at Deloitte. So where does tech, AI, IoT, 5G, you know, sort of the, silicon, the, the technology that's coming out of Silicon Valley, you know, how does that really drive this forward? 
Well, so it, it plays a lot of different roles. One is what we need to do is we need to create transparency and traceability to um, the impact of climate in every step of these value chains. And what that will do is as we move to lean supply chains or lean value chains, it gives us the chance to make more informed decisions, not only about the carbon impact, but the cost trade-offs of doing certain things. So I'll give you one little tiny example. Prior to COVID and the work we were doing in future mobility, we built an application with AWS around um, container inspection using computer vision. And it's used in some ports. And what's really important about it is it speeds the time from where that container is in terms of its landing to where it needs to go. And at the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles or, or up in Vancouver or on the East Coast, you got trucks idling. And so what we didn't really sort of think about is if I could reduce the idle time, well, guess what? I'm reducing emissions. And it may only be fractions. But the fractions add up if you start to do it everywhere. And those are the kinds of things that we have the availability to do here. Another one is in the food system, the FDA is about to issue guidelines in terms of creating transparency across the value chain. No different than like when you and I back in New York, we see the calorie count at Starbucks on the things we're buying. Well, that would be hugely helpful. Now you've got every food system player, you have the entire value chain starting to think about that. What will happen ultimately is we will begin to monetize and probably price the externalities that exist in this system because no one's going to want to bear them. And ultimately, the corporations that are bearing them today are buying carbon offsets, which are far less you know, impactful than in terms of actually taking, moving to net zero and taking carbon out of these value chains. Yeah, I think uh, I was talking to MasterCard. They actually have a carbon calculator where that in your statement, it'll be able to now add, you know, car, you know, the carbon consumption based on your consumer behaviors, right? So how do we incentivize and get people to change their behavior? Um, so have you heard anything yet this morning that surprised you, you know, throughout the, the conversations? You mentioned Ryan, Speed and Scale, Lucas was up here. Has there been anything that, that you heard that you said, wow, that's, that's not traditionally how I would think about this problem? Well, what I actually heard were um, pieces that fit together that sort of reinforce this idea of systems approaches. There's a lot of attention coming this way. And you're seeing it in major NGOs. You're seeing it in academic institutions. You're seeing it in the Amazon, Walmart, Microsoft world. Um, that there's sort of a recognition. Paul Pullman just came out with a new book called Net Positive. He makes a very big play that systems from his Unilever experience, that if you really want to have impact, you have to think about that. So we're you know, in the process of basically um, working with a bunch of these different bodies to build a movement. This is not, we're not going into our you know, conference rooms with white, whiteboards and doing this on our own. What we want to do is be a catalyst to the acceleration of this. Because if we can create maps of how we can get to a net zero future in systems that break down to sectors and subsectors, and you can get the players to start to work together, we have a chance, and I would underscore only a chance, of potentially achieving the targets of the Paris Accords. But if we don't do this, we most likely are not going to achieve those targets. Right. Any, if there's any questions, we're going to have a, a minute or so. If there's any questions out here, please raise your hand. And our friend John back there will, will grab the mic. Um, oh, there's one, John, right in front of you. Jane, back there. Hi, yep. Jane Long. Um, I study electricity and decarbonization electricity a lot. And one of the, <clears throat> I, I want to resonate with your systems approach. You know, we hear a lot today about uh, how specific technologies have to be cheaper. But one of the issues that you see in electricity is they have to have utility. They have to, uh, you know, we can, we can probably solve diurnal uh, intermittency problems with batteries, but we're not going to solve seasonal mismatch problems where uh, winter time we don't get as much solar. So um, I think one of the issues is that people buy things according to the specific technology, and we need to have them buy them according to the system impact. Do you have any ideas about how to do that? Yeah, so it's a fantastic question. And um, ultimately, we need to get down these scale curves. I feel like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, you know, we're out of time, we're out of time. 
And the challenge is we can't wait another 20, 30 years for solar, the equivalent of solar and wind to, to reach price parity. And so we're going to have to figure out either we start to price in some of the negative externalities or a carbon tax to be able to underwrite this. You know, today, like you talk about sustainable aviation fuel as an example, it's a biofuel. It, it's pretty good as a bridge technology. It cuts carbon emissions by about 40%, but it costs five times more per gallon of, you know, an existing jet fuel going into those same tanks. So we've got to figure out how are you going to incent the supply side to make the investments with assurance on the demand side. And so there's things that um, uh, EDF and Rocky Mountain Institute have built the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance. You're going to see a lot of commercial players that need to address climate change and to find these creative, non-traditional um, marriages of convenience or partnerships and collaboration. We've been seeing the rise of ecosystems for a long time, but their moment has really come if we're going to have movement here. And your point about how this plays in renewable is spot on. And so that's also where all this government investment can't be sort of single point. It needs to be tied back to where these systems are going. That's the one concern I have is that we're we're not quite adapting that lens as it relates to, you know, sort of the role of government funding and investment about where we're going. So any final just thoughts to the group? You know, you said we know where we need to go. We know how much we need to cut. You know, when you talk to a group like this that really sort of represents all these constituencies, any final closing? Well, you know? and we have, you know, a lot of what we need to make major progress. And so it's time to get on with it. And we've got to sort of break out of traditional boundaries to do that. And Deloitte is committed to playing a real role in trying to facilitate that and contribute as best we can. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Scott, for joining thank us today. Thank you, Josh.